Welcome to the highlights of Astronomy Toronto. I'm your host, Randy Atwood. Today we'll look back at the last year of Astronomy Toronto program. It's been an exciting year covering recent happenings in astronomy, visiting observatories in Ontario, and watching the first Canadian blast off into orbit. Amateur astronomy is becoming more popular as people learn to enjoy watching the skies. An avid amateur astronomer, Michael Watson, told us what amateur astronomers do. I guess the first question, Michael, is what is an amateur astronomer? Well, really, Randy, an amateur astronomer is anyone who enjoys getting out and looking up into the night sky and uh, looking at the stars, the moon, whether with a telescope or just with the naked eye. What, uh, what do amateurs uh, do, mainly? Depends on your level of sophistication, but right from the beginning, an amateur just gets out, looks up with the, with the, the unaided eye, looks at the stars. Uh, organizations get together and have star parties uh, by telescopes and look at the stars with telescopes visit observatories, planetariums, and that sort of thing. So really you have different levels of, of seriousness. Very just, much. Just like any other hobby. Very much. All right, let's say uh, someone out there was interested in getting uh, into amateur astronomy. Uh, what are some of the things that they would do to get started? Probably one of the, the first things, and, and I think that this is always a very good idea, is to join an astronomy club. And of course the, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, as the largest national astronomical organization in the world, is, is a natural. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the good things to do to, to start to meet amateur astronomers. Apart from that, what you really want to do is, uh, is read a little bit. Another amateur astronomer, Jillian Buryak, drew the moon as she saw it through her telescope and as she saw it during a lunar eclipse. This drawing I did just before a lunar eclipse in July of 1982. And I was out in my backyard and before the eclipse started I was waiting around and then I decided to draw it. And I'd never really drawn the moon before, so I just was sketching and did a whole bunch of sketches. And then from those, I took them inside the next day and then drew uh, a finished product of that. And then I came up with this drawing of the full moon. You also have a, a beautiful series of color pastel and pencil drawings of uh, the lunar eclipse in 1982. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful sequence. Uh, tell us about what we're seeing here. It's over the, over the silhouette of my house, which is the darker black on the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me. And I did it as the Earth rotates. It appears that the moon travels across the, the sky. So I then did each one where it appeared, each moon where it appeared over my house during the sequence when the moon passes through the Earth's shadow. And then it's right in the central part of the shadow. That's called the total eclipse. And then when it comes out, and by the time it comes out, it's morning. So. And it really was uh, this reddish color, wasn't it? It was very red. It was very, very difficult to see and even more difficult to photograph. One minute! One minute! One thing some amateur astronomers in Toronto have done over the past few years is to travel around the world to view and photograph eclipses of the sun. We drove to North Carolina to see a near-total eclipse in May 1984. Watch this scene as the maximum phase of the eclipse turns day into night for a few short seconds. Oh, I see prominence! I see prominence! I see prominence! I see prominence! Oh, look! I see prominence! I see prominence! Oh, incredible prominence there! Prominence there! Oh, extraordinary! Oh, beautiful prominence! In November 1984, we traveled to Papua New Guinea to see a total eclipse of the sun. 
Michael Watson describes what we were able to see. What this shows is that the brightness of the corona diminishes very quickly as you move out from the edge of the uh, sun. A slightly longer exposure here shows a little more corona, and as we get further along, we get more and more corona as we lengthen the exposures with our cameras. So let's look at the next one, which should show us that, uh, a a more, of a, more corona because, again, of the longer exposure. And now the corona is filling the full frame. One of the really exciting things about this eclipse, and something we really didn't expect, was that there, there was a great deal of structure in the corona. The corona did not appear to uh, be evenly round around the darkened moon. Uh, rather, it appeared to have long streamers going out from the equator. And then those little polar brushes that you can see sort of at 11 o'clock in the upper left corner uh, of the photograph and in the lower right. And that made just an extraordinary visual sight. Last fall, we followed our six Canadian astronauts as they prepared for the first flight of a Canadian aboard the space shuttle. Ken Money, 48, is the oldest astronaut and currently lives in Toronto. Dr. Money has a strong background in space sickness research. Dr. Roberta Bondar, 37, is a neurobiologist at McMaster University in Hamilton. Steve McLean, 28, is an Ottawa native with a PhD in astrophysics and laser physics from York University. Bjarni Trigvason, 38, is a native of Iceland with a degree in engineering. Dr. Robert Thirst, 30, is a medical doctor. He holds an MA in Biomedical Engineering from MIT and a medical degree from McGill. Finally, Mark Garneau, 34, is a commander in the Navy, an engineer and design specialist in communications and electronic warfare. If I was to ask you what the benefits are of sending Canadians in space, could you uh, sum it up for me in a, in a few words? If we, don't send a if we don't get involved in the space program, 20 years from now, we will not be anywhere near the bandwagon. I think space technology is, uh, is where things are happening. It's where technology is improving the fastest. And I think uh, we should participate as best we can, as we have in the past, but maybe even more now. Otherwise, we'll get behind. In October, we were at the Kennedy Space Center for go. the spectacular launch of Mark Garneau. Right. Go! Go, baby! Woo! Oh, look at the brightness of that. Oh. All right. Space shuttle launches are a spectacular sight, but very difficult to photograph. Here are the pictures that Michael Watson and myself took from the press site as the space shuttle cleared the tower. Once the solid rocket boosters clear that tower, the brightness increases dramatically. We didn't know it, but our remote site cameras got some just spectacular photos. This is what it looked like the day before. And this is what it looked like just a few seconds after launch with a wide angle lens. And the colors are quite extraordinary as the space shuttle goes up into the clouds. This is a closer view now, a 135 millimeter photograph of the main engines firing up and the solid rocket boosters igniting and the space shuttle just leaping up off the tower. And again, the camera has to close down to compensate for the very, very bright solid rocket booster flame. The color change in just such a few seconds was quite extraordinary. We're very, very pleased with these results. 
After the mission, Mark Garneau showed us some pictures from his trip. Just to uh, explain the first little part of it, there's about 20 seconds at the beginning where you see what looks like the launch. And in fact, it's a camera that's in the pilot's window. And you imagine the orbiter in the vertical position. And it's taking a picture of what it sees. And the orbiter takes off and starts to roll. And you'll see the orbiter basically, or what the orbiter sees, rising and rolling and passing through the cloud cover. So that's something you have to look for right at the beginning in order to understand it. If you put your head on your right, sh right shoulder, you'll, you'll probably be able to straighten out your perspective a little bit. And anyway, I'll ramble on after that point uh, as, the, as the video continues to try to uh, give you a feeling for some of the things that maybe aren't straightforward. OK, that's the, uh, the launch. There you are coming through the uh, cloud cover. This is to show you how many people were really actually on the flight. If you count them, I think you'll find that there were really 14 of us. We're doing a fly past here through the mid-deck. <laughs> and you can't see it on the monitors, but it says Fly Navy on the galley. And it was a, a Navy mission, which we were rather proud of. And you'll see there are actually 14 people. Here I am snagged in a cable. And it looks like we're going slow motion, but that's really how you move. That's real speed. There we go. Second, second squadron passing by. And of course, there was a 15th person, the cameraman. You never saw, you never saw her during the whole trip. We had a ball. There's no doubt about it. If you ever have a chance to get up there, I encourage you to go. Tom Wojek of the McLaughlin Planetarium took us on a tour of our solar system in a search for life. Second condition. I think in the first slide here we have a picture of our closest neighbor, the closest neighbor to us, which is the moon. And we'll see that uh, here's a moon cut in half, I guess just two different views, Tom. <clears throat> That's right, the, the first quarter and the last quarter moon sandwiched together. At one time when astronomers first uh, had telescopes and when they looked at the moon, they thought that the dark areas they saw on the moon were seas. In fact, they called these seas mare. Mm -hmm. But the seas are not really made up of water. They're made up of, um, well, um, lava, lava, lava that's bubbled up from deep with, within the core of the moon and smoothed over certain areas. It's now turned into a powdery gray soil. And the dozen or so astronauts that have landed on the moon and analyzed the moon found that, well, there's just the conditions are not right for life to form. Uh, let alone survive. Uh, it's too hot on the moon and it's too cold. There's no atmosphere. Water would just boil away or sublimate into the atmosphere. This next photograph looks like the moon but is not the moon. It is the planet Mercury. Mercury is, is similar to the moon but double the size, a little more in fact, the size of, of the moon. It too has no atmosphere and the close-up illustrations and photographs of Mercury show that it's a barren, desolate world. Its surface is baked by the sun to well over 400 degrees Celsius, far too hot for water to be in a liquid state, and far too hot, f too hot for life to survive. It really takes an expert to, to tell the difference between the moon and Mercury. They, they look like very similar worlds. That's right. I think the real key is to look on the, on the slide, the bottom of the slide. If you can tell, <laughs> that, that's where it's, they're that close. They're very similar. The next planet in our tour is Venus. And Venus is about the same size of the Earth. And also about the same weight. It's often been called the Earth's twin, and for, for many years, astronomers really thought that beneath those clouds which blanket the planet, there might be living organisms, perhaps a, uh, an intelligent race of some sort, perhaps vast tropical rainforests. But it wasn't until spacecraft landed on the planet and surveyed the planet did we actually discover that there can be no life, at least life as we know it, on the surface of Mercury. The temperatures here are actually higher than they are back on, uh, on Mercury well over 450 degrees Celsius. It's got a, a, a blistering climate. This uh, radar map shows some of the, uh, the high areas, the, the mountains and the low areas on Venus. It's, uh, it, its atmosphere pressure cooks the surface, a pressure well over 90 times that of the Earth. And it's constantly raining hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. Not a very good place for life.
Here's an excellent place for life. An ideal place for life, the Earth. And uh, it's, it's curious that from orbit, you cannot detect the presence of intelligent life. Only when you zoom in close uh, to the planet can you begin to see traces of a technologically advanced intelligent life. All right, this next planet is the planet Mars, where for 100 years people have been thinking that there may be life. Mars, I think, is the planet that's inspired science fiction writers the most. Uh, <clears throat> some astronomers thought they saw canals, living forms of uh, or an, an evidence of intelligent forms of life. Close-up photographs reveal no, none of these um, evidence of canals. But when we look closely, we see um, fine tendrils, little uh, waterways. But these waterways uh, pose quite a problem to astronomers because right now there is no liquid water on the surface of the planet. Where did the water come from and where has it gone now? It's quite a mystery to some astronomers. Here's another uh, picture that makes it look like there was water at one time on Mars. Flash floods. It indicates that at one time Mars was a, a, a warmer planet, a planet that perhaps could, could um, support life, a planet that might have simple forms of life that lurk uh, perhaps in the soil. The Viking landers, which uh, landed on the surface of the planet, took photographs. I think this is one of the most, these are among the most amazing photographs ever taken by anyone or anything, the surface of what another planet actually looks like. And those, uh, those trough marks are not, well, caused by a little creature burrowing into the soil, but caused by the, the space arm that's dug deep within the soil and uh, collected some of the soil, analyzed it for simple forms of life, microbes, bacteria, viruses, and it found none. Mars likely is a world that cannot support life. Incidentally, the, the seasons, Mars goes through seasons as, as the Earth does, and the snow that we see here is uh, snow made up of frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice, just a bit too cold for life to form. The next planet is the first of what we call the gas giants. And one of the next questions when Project Galileo reaches Jupiter in 1988 is will they find anything that resembles life in the high clouds of Jupiter? They'll actually be sending a, a, a spacecraft that'll dip into the atmosphere and analyze, chemically directly analyze the, the molecules. Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It has no solid surface. It's literally clouds layered on top of each other. And trying to land a spacecraft on the planet would be like trying to land on a cloud. You just fall through to deeper and deeper clouds. Some astronomers speculate that perhaps in these clouds, molecules could combine together to form simple creatures. Perhaps in the great red spot, there might be creatures that, that float within the atmosphere. But uh, most astronomers are rather skeptical of the idea just because of the, the high winds and the, uh, the convection currents, which would suck the material deep within the core of the planet and destroy the material. Well, this is my favorite planet, Saturn. But I think once the Voyager spacecraft went out there, they began to realize that it's getting much, much too cold for life, isn't it? That's right. The showpiece of the solar system lurks, well, no, towards the, the outskirts of the solar system. Saturn, it too, is a gas giant. It's, uh, it's a, it's a world made up of, of gas and of clouds, but if its most defining feature are the, the rings which encircle the world. And these rings are probably chunks of ice and rock or, or rock covered with ice about the size of beach balls, and each of them are in, in orbit around the entire planet. It's as if there's billions of individual moons that encircle the entire world. Close-up views of Saturn reveal cloud formations, um, details within the, within the outer cloud tops. It turns out that it is just too cold. Um, and it's, if the conditions on Jupiter are not ideal for life, then the conditions on, on Saturn are even worse. In 1986, the famous Halley's Comet will be visible from Toronto. Dr. Ian Halliday of the National Research Council told us what we can look forward to. Dr. Halliday, what makes Comet Halley so special? Well, the important thing about it is that it's a very reliable comet. It shows all kinds of cometary activity. It's got the two kinds of tail, both the dust particles and the electrified gas particles. Uh, it's got a big halo around it. It shows every type of cometary activity. 
It's predictable. It comes around every 75 or 76 years. Ian McGregor of the McLaughlin Planetarium described the parts of a comet. And this is, uh, again, an artist's depiction of a, of a comet. Basically, it's the large nucleus. The nucleus of a comet is somewhere between 5 and 10 kilometers in diameter. It's mostly made up of ice with a little bit of rock and dust thrown in. We're not completely sure of how comets are held together, but we know when a comet moves in towards the sun that the radiation from the stun, sun starts to break up the ice particles. It starts to fall off. We see a few rocks that are sitting in there, and the comet's uh, material falls behind the comet as it moves in towards the sun and produces the spectacular tails that we associate with them. Well, I'm standing now in front of Canada's largest radio telescope up here at Lake Travers in northern Ontario, actually northern Algonquin Park. This is the uh, Algonquin Radio Observatory, and it is quite a large telescope. It's, it looks like a huge satellite receiver that you might see on someone's front lawn. But actually, it's 46 meters. That's 150 feet across, 150 feet in diameter. One of the interesting things about this dish on this radio telescope is the fact that part of it isn't actually a solid, smooth surface, but it's a wire mesh. If you can look right up there along the edge of the dish, you can see that you can actually see through it. Now, the reason for this is because, again, we're looking at radio waves and now l not light waves. For an optical telescope, you have to have a very fine polished mirror. But for this radio telescope, the wavelengths of the radio signals coming in are longer, that is, they're larger than the mesh itself. As you can see, this radio telescope is just tremendous. It actually weighs, at the very top, about 900 tons. That is, that is the actual weight of the part of the telescope that is moved around. The dish itself is well over 300 tons. Now, an interesting thing, too, is the fact that the part of the telescope that does all the moving, it's on a very large pier that it sunk about 40 feet down into the bedrock. The rest of this building that you see behind me is not actually touching that pier. There's a gap around it so that any mechanical movements that the telescope sets up is not passed on to the building and vice versa. Here you can see the gear assembly that's used to move the dish up and down. Incredibly large gear system. And it's interesting, when we were up inside there, you could hear the fans going. You could uh, feel the entire dish move like a rumbling action as uh, the astronomers were moving back and forth and up and down. The amazing thing is it's a very, very precise piece of instrumentation, about as precise as a fine-made watch. We also visited the David Dunlap Observatory, situated in Richmond Hill. The David Dunlap Observatory celebrated its 50th anniversary in May 1985. Dr. Tom Bolton, an astronomer at the observatory, told us what an astronomer does and showed us the telescope itself. What does a, an astronomer do apart from, I think everyone might have an idea that he just looks through a telescope. Uh, there's a lot more to it, isn't there? Well, in fact, looking through a telescope is probably, uh, usually isn't done, in fact. It's, uh, uh, I think that is a, a major misconception by the general public. A telescope for professional astronomers is basically a big camera. You look for through it just enough to make sure you're pointed at the right object, and then you use the telescope to collect the light and uh, focus it into an instrument that is used to uh, analyze the light in some way or another. Uh, so the uh, uh, astronomer very rarely uh, looks through a telescope, particularly in modern days now where we often use television cameras uh, as the guiding instruments through the telescope. Uh, it's quite common that one doesn't uh, look through a telescope at all. And I've even had observing uh, experience observing uh, where I've observed for several nights in a row and never even seen a telescope. Well, I've joined Tom in the dome of the 74-inch telescope. And Tom, could you tell me a bit about the telescope itself? Well, the telescope is basically a camera that uh, is mounted on a clock. And the uh, camera collects light and focuses it on some sort of detector. And the clock drives the telescope to follow the motion of the stars as they rise and set. 
Now what we have here is a reflecting telescope, which means that the light comes down the tube to a primary mirror, which in this case is 74 inches in diameter. It's about a foot thick, weighs a couple of tons, mounted in a, a mechanical uh, mechanism which weighs about 40 tons. And the whole thing is driven to follow the stars. When the light strikes this primary mirror, it's reflected back up the tube to, towards a focus, and there it intercepts a small secondary mirror, which reflects it back down the tube again, still bringing it towards a focus, and the light passes through a small hole in the center of the primary mirror and comes to a focus then at the entrance aperture to the instrument, which in our case is usually a spectrograph which is just a device for spreading the light out into a spectrum and then recording it in some way. One thing I am quite sure of, that the next 50 years will be more exciting than the last 50. The capabilities of the observatory, the increase in staff we've had uh, in the last 15 years has meant that the science that we've done during that period of time was so much more exciting than the science that was done in the previous 35 because of the, the increased capabilities and the development of the field as well. And, and that's a process that's continuing. We have new space uh, instruments coming that will provide data which will need ground-based backup. That's an area where David Dunlap Observatory has made a, an extremely valuable con contribution in the past. I'm confident we'll continue to do so. I can hardly wait. The upcoming season of Astronomy Toronto should be quite exciting. Halley's Comet will be visible for several months starting this December. The Voyager 2 spacecraft will return pictures of the planet Uranus from close range in January. And as Tom Bolton said, the science of astronomy is always revealing some remarkable discoveries. Astronomy Toronto will be here on Rogers Cable 10 to bring them all to you.